yeah as, as, as brooke has said it's um yeah there's it's been a bit of a journey for me i've actually just just arrived back yesterday well i say yesterday <laughs> it is now 2 a.m in the uk and just arrived back from an uh, incredible month in indonesia where i'm yeah working with an incredible team um on program Salamat Kanyaki, which is Indonesian for save the Sulawesi crested black macaques. So it's an integrated conservation program focused on macaca nigra or yaki as they're known locally. And so yeah, today I'm going to share a little bit about some of the work we're doing and some of the key issues of coexistence. And there, yeah, as I think as previously, there's probably not going to be much time for questions in this session, but then yeah, hopefully if everyone's joining in the um, in the session later, we should be able to unpack some of the some of the key themes and some of the key kind of ideas that are emerging. And I'd love to hear from from everyone who's joining. There seems to be a lot of experts here and such an amazing circle. So really great to be able to develop some innovative approaches and understandings to some of these key challenges in conservation. So obviously a big focus of this session in particular, and what I'm going to be focusing on chatting about today is this 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 notion of coexistence so this kind of stems from these um this human wildlife interactions or interface or whatever terminology is lots of semantics and it's quite quite a tricky one to navigate through but um it's obviously a huge challenge in conservation so as obviously the the human populations increase and um, into natural habitats and also of course in, in even restoring and rewilding areas where they may have been um uh yeah degraded habitat as well so that, that contact between people and wild animals is is obviously growing as we see with the pandemic as well so there's huge implications for for those relationships as well so many species even many of the most beautiful and charismatic and endangered um can also have major impacts on on human livelihoods and, and welfare um tigers can, can can kill people of course uh, many animals um, are optimal foragers so they just they have impact on crops and livelihoods um, and often livestock as well in um, some areas. So primates in particular, um, in particular macaques, they are highly adaptable, they're very intelligent, these opportunistic optimal foragers and they readily, readily take up this chance for, for an easy feed or often when there's pressures of lack of food in the, in the forest. So historically in quite kind of the easy path people typically uh respond to those threats by killing wildlife wherever possible so that's obviously not what we want um, particularly with endangered species such as the critically endangered uh, macaca nigra then obviously this is um, an incredible uh, issue that we need to address as well Harry, um, can i interrupt for just a quick second yeah, i'm not sure whether your slides should have moved along but we're still on yeah, the first slide still in, still in intro okay, still in right. okay, yeah. only ask yeah. because i had that problem during my uh introduction mine okay, wasn't yeah. moving on perfectly fine <laughs> no worries at all. I'm, I'm just giving a long-winded intro just because it's a quite an important uh yeah i think to to understand that kind of what coexistence means so obviously this this urgent need to conserve species demands that coexistence that kind of living together and that, that ability to live together and that's what i'm going to sort of cover today and see how what we can get through so i'm going to start with a little bit of an introduction to the yaki um talk about what those those kind of relationships are and how they why they're important um, to understand the different the kind of nuance of those relationships and also kind of some of the key key issues for coexistence as well um, also touching upon social science and some of the approaches that at Salama Kunyaki and some of the um, understandings that we've been able to gain in in this area particularly about um, connectedness to nature as well and also a couple of examples about some of the work that we're doing which helps this this notion of coexistence so, but first of all, um, so I hope some of you are familiar with these these incredible monkeys. Um, I've been very, very blessed and honoured to have spent um, the last 10 years working with amazing local team to protect these monkeys and a lot of time in the forest with them as well in the natural habitat. Incredibly social, very iconic and charismatic um, and uh, living in groups of up to 100 individuals. But of course, as with many of these species in this limited geographic range, they are... Um, yeah, they're under a huge amount of pressure from the expanding human population. So the population numbers, um, always tricky one because uh, of a lot of extrapolation, but typically we, we look at about 80% population decline in about 40 years for this species. So in 2008, following some surveys from 
um, the Wild Planet Trust at that time, Whitley Wilder Conservation Trust and other researchers, then the, the status went from endangered to critically endangered in 2008. So what's causing this decline? It's um, consumption for bushmeat in North Sulawesi is, is emerged in the, kind of about the 1980s as this, this habit and has kind of been ingrained into this identity of, of kind of the, some of the local sub ethnicities and that's become very problematic and they're carrying forward that identity and obviously the impact that has on consumption. So majority of hunting it isn't for subsistence, it typically for more of a ceremonial or special food, more of a luxury. Um, and yeah, generally people in North Sulawesi have a relatively high protein and caloric intake. And they are, I mean, it's a very interesting social and cultural situation in North Sulawesi as well. So it, as I'm not sure if many people have been there, but it's a, it's a, a beautiful place and people are incredibly friendly, known as the land of the smiling people. 2.8 million people, uh, a majority of Christian uh, population as well. So there's a very, very deep sense of community and um, lots of mutual aid systems as well, which is something that for my own doctoral research, I've been particularly interested in and how that connects to more pro-environmental behavior and conservation behaviors in itself and how we can maybe nurture that sense of pro-sociality, which I'll touch upon very briefly as well. So, and what it all comes down to really is this, this um, these relationships. So due to this like very restricted geographic range in, in North Sulawesi, that's a very northeastern tip, there's this um, called an anthropogenic landscape. So the pressures on the remaining contiguous forests and the wildlife that inhabit them have obviously increased. So important, very important to design research, but also in intervention strategies, which improve the protection of those remaining forests, uh, but also understand the social cultural drivers of those relationships. And also very important, of course, when we talk about coexistence, it's talking about kind of building those more positive um, emotional connections to the wildlife. So maybe shifting from, from negative perception or maybe malevolent or um, kind of thinking of the monkeys as um, outsiders or as maybe even sometimes as pests to more positive, more benevolent perspectives of inclusion and empathy towards the monkeys, the yaki, and also over wildlife. So um, those, these kind of interactions, of course, for many people here may be familiar, um, kind of fall under this approach of ethnoprimatology, the goals of which, of course, to understand the dynamic ecosystems in which humans and primates can coexist. So we've got social data from since 2007 to understanding resource use, um, attitudes, awareness, and also behavioral um, kind of drivers and in indications of behaviors there as well. So being able to kind of profile and understand the character characteristics of society, um, and also working together with the local communities in those research, um, and be able to understand attitudes, values, beliefs in particular from the social psychological side as well, um, is really, really important. And just, just because this is very important, so in terms of the monkeys, um, as, as with most macaques, as I've highlighted, um, they, you know, they're, they're optimal foragers, so crop foraging, I tend not to use the term raiding, I think that's um, generally, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, preferred for many people. Um, so in the agricultural crops, so those farms which are directly in the, um, the, the outer perimeter and have, uh, yeah, direct proximity to the forest, then groups of monkeys and other um, animals such as wild pigs tend to go in here, some, some tasty crops, I think I might might have a look into these. Um, and of course, so my, my previous research actually in Southeast Sulawesi and Bhutan Island, I worked with Dr. Nancy Priston on a long-term longitudinal program looking at um, attitudes and different kind of behavioral interventions of farmers and deterrent strategies. So very mixed results of course and it's an, just to highlight it's an incredibly big challenge which needs a lot of cooperation and long-term management there's no easy fixes to to, to avoid the, the persecution and the kind of the easy route of, of killing or um, harming animals so some of these um, kind of strategies just touching upon these because this is something that we're working on um, and kind of building into a project into the coming years as well is looking at selective crop plantation as, a, as an important which has been a proven uh, approach in, in some locations, such as in, in Bhutan. So essentially putting the most valuable crops further further away from the edge, so the monkeys have to go further into the farm, um, and that's that's been proven to reduce the kind of the monkey invasions or the monkeys entering them, the foraging in the farms. So having these planting those buffer crops 10 meters into the, into the farm, or maybe highly palatable and important subsistence crops way more into the center, so at least 
20 meters from the border. Um, chilies and other kind of crops that monkeys don't really like on the outside makes a lot more sense. Um, and also what I just what I've noticed as well is that um, other, other kind of measures as well, like um, buffer zones as well, really, really important. But what we see is that there's quite a lot of effort and actually what kind of one of the key problems and issues is, is that um, what I've noticed in North Sulawesi in particular is that there are only a few farmers who are actually directly affected by crop damage um, in each village. And these are often very much in the, the boundary of forest farm mosaic. Um, but also they can play a major role in, in kind of directing and governing the perceptions or the perspective, especially if they're particularly vocal or influential within their communities. So while it may not be a huge amount of those who are in individual livelihoods which are affected negatively, it can often be quite damaging in terms of, you know, one, maybe one group being killed or poisoned or the monkeys, but also then the effects on the perceptions of the macaques as well. So we have in our, in our framework for action attempt to better understand and document the frequency and distribution of these interactions as well and understand some of these kind of maybe the potentiality recommendations for some of these measures as well. So just running through the, some of these other kind of de uh, demonstrated effective in, uh, interventions as well, buffer zones, so having this, not having the, the, the juicy papayas right next to reaching distance from the, from the, from the big trees there to the forest having a bit of a buffer zone, fences, mixed mixed um, uh, effectiveness, but sometimes they can have a, a level of deterrence. Uh, and then other barriers, guarding in particular, I mean, certain projects such as um, Barbary Macaque projects have demonstrated that tends to be one of the most important. So having people on, on site, and it's kind of costly sometimes, but challenging, but often most effective. And also, also others, like experimental ones, such as having dogs on site, if the dogs are uh yeah of, uh, confident enough to chase away a group of monkeys often they the monkeys chase the dogs um and then also bees and aromas have been also demonstrated to have some effect on on the uh, yeah reducing those crop foraging instances as well so we're currently working on a, a project with uh, together with the macaque negro project um called um well it's actually directly with the asian species action program and developing materials for recommended interventions especially if they are, um, as we've, we're seeing as well during the pandemic, increasing reports coming in from um, some of this crop, crop foraging and these human wildlife interactions in, 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 in across these like recent months this year in particular. So very, very important to empower farmers work together and also running these uh, focus group discussions that are coming up in the coming months, actually, right, looking into the early next year. So giving a sense of ownership, co-creating ideas, really, really important. So it's not just shoving a few recommendations and saying, you guys pay for it and work it out. You know, it takes a lot of long-term work together. So just very briefly, um, in terms of Solomon Makunyaki, with just a kind of a snapshot, we very much work on positive mindsets and, and, and look at uh, co-creating, uh, yeah, yeah, positive approaches to to um, yeah, more harmonious relationships with nature, reducing the threats to also obviously other St. Patrick species, um, increasing the uh, working together with the forestry department to in, in enhance the protection and the efficacy of protected areas, um, helping you know, work on this emotion of pride in particular. So we have a lot of campaigns in the area using this um, two-step role model approach, and also very importantly, balancing the needs of nature and society. So we have a number of different projects and approaches, but we're too far into there. We could talk that through later in, in the session. But very importantly, a lot of our approaches and our strategies are grounded in the social sciences. So this is my part-time PhD across seven years um, really gave it such an eye-opener for me, just understanding that environmental problems, of course, are, are people problems. You know, it's, it's, we need to understand that if the, the threats to a species, they typically are anthropogenic, then we need to know those cultural and behavioral drivers as well. So conservation biology now, of course, is a meta-discipline and it's, you need to be able to understand the natural and social sciences together in this social ecological systems approach. So yeah, there's lots of different theories to explain social behaviors and motivations and things. So um, I've been able to use and explore some of those for immersive ethnography and understand some of the communities better and work directly with them to, to understand their needs and their attitudes, their perceptions, particularly the values that underpin society and how they may uh, affect co uh, coexistence with the wildlife living alongside. 
so what I particularly found, I won't, I'm not going to unpack all of my, my, my PhD research, but really relevant to this subject now, um, is about pro-sociality. And a lot of people aren't always familiar about this. I'm, I wasn't that familiar about pro-sociality, to be honest, before I started at Solomon Konyaki. But really, it's such an important aspect and such an important dimension of the conservation recipe as well, because pro-sociality is the basis of all social interaction and cohesion. It's about communal behaviours, maybe helping one another and understanding how kind of this communal social behaviors benefit the whole society and potentially also uh, the natural world as well. So in North Sulawesi, as I mentioned earlier, very strong sense of community and these is mutual aid systems which help one another. So, and that's what we know from the research and pro-sociality is that um, to a very large extent, social life is regulated by distributive and recipro reciprocity norms. So very much about um, social norms and how people understand what is normal in society. So yeah, what I found in particular in my research is that, that there was a very strong relationship between pro-social behaviors, like these helping one another, these mutual aid systems and community and pro-environmentalism. So these conservation behaviors, this potential to, to help one another, to help animals and wildlife and natural places as well. They stem from the same um, social psychological and sociological pathways. So very interesting. I'd be happy to talk more about that at another time. But one of the key kind of lessons that emerged is that um, this is about empathy. And really, we are natural, we are our natural innate desire to belong and to, to empathize with one another, but also with other with other beings, with other, with other animals, and also with the natural world. And we can help prime that and really to empathize is to socialize so empathy is socializing so to be able to expand our kind of empathic reach from one another for this very highly social communities to animals and to the natural world and understanding those mechanisms is really really powerful um and it's it really comes down to that one of the very critical lines of thinking um in, in particular a very um fundamental determinant of the level of concern and this level of um, potentiality for coexistence is people's sense of connection to nature and the degree of integration in which they see themselves in the natural world. So this is all about biophilia, some, some of you may be familiar with that from E.O. Wilson, this idea that humans have this innate drive to affiliate with other living, living beings, building on this Gaia hypothesis from James Lovelock. And it's, it's very critical thinking because if we can help nurture that sense and understand the pro-sociality, then we can help work towards this sense of coexistence. So there's key, three key things I want to just touch upon, and I'll come back to this later in the session um, that we're going to have uh, just slightly later on. So three sort of key central social psychological facets that are important, I believe, in, in this idea of notions of coexistence. So it's about kind of attitudes. What are the dominant perceptions? And um, also what are those, the values that underpin those and relate to those? And also what are the belief systems which maybe mediate the expression of those attitudes? Then there's the social norms, which, you know, people, you know, um, what do people most believe is the right thing to do? But also what do most people believe most people are doing? <laughs> um, that's really critical because that social norms will either say, yes, we can be tolerant or, or yes, we can persecute and it's okay to kill and to poison the monkeys. So those norms will really govern the, uh, the expression of coexistence. But there's also very much, of course, some situational issues. We have capacity, the, the, the kind of the finance behind these kind of interventions that I mentioned earlier. Who's going to pay them? Who can, who's got the time to do them? And there may be other barriers to change um, as, as, as individuals, but also within the societies. We'll look and understand those as well, those drivers. But what I also, what I noticed in particular is important, is that this is, in North Sulawesi in particular, there's this real shift in perceptions um, towards animals and towards wildlife and these emergent environmental identities because of these highly pro-social um, communal values that I discovered in the, in the communities and also interesting um, yeah kind of emergence of the old and new belief systems as well there's this new powerful um, norms that which are emerging about being proud of nature and these are the ones that we want to harness we want to be able to work together and build these um, these positive social norms and positive attitudes within the communities. So integrating these insights from behavioural science through this blended grassroots and multi-stakeholder approach, um, empowering local community representatives for change. And we've built that, that approach into this two-step approach. So nurturing local leaders, tribal leaders, 
maybe government leaders, religious leaders as well, but in particular these youth leaders. We've just been to 50 schools over this last month um, in a new campaign area of four campaign areas over the years, um, seeing the emergence of these um, yaki ambassadors. So they, this two-step approach is um, understanding the different subsections of society and empowering them to spread the messages. So here we have government leaders and also um, even popular influential role models such as the rock and roll band Slank here. And just to, just finally, to what, what, what this is also having impact on is um, some of, if some, anyone's been to North of the Way, see there's this, been these popular markets in the past, they call them extreme markets, such as Tomahon Market. And we've made this uh, through this approach, um, been able to work together with the, with the market sellers and also with the, the, the market leaders and government representatives as well. To, to, we've taken the signs down and we've helped them to be proud and, and working on generating collective demand for change, that people are proud not to sell endangered species, as this sign says here, and also any protected or endangered species. So very, very important progress, um, and that's going to really help sow those seeds of coexistence. And finally, we have this um, role model roadshow approach. So working with hunters who no longer hunt these protected species, such as the monkeys, and, and having them, empowering them and nurturing them and training them, giving them the opportunity to spread the word to hundreds and hundreds of other communities. Um, so many, many different villages, um, empowering them, take, um, giving them a bit of a roadshow, and it's been signing declarations for change. Um, but also, uh, of course, importantly, there's also the kind of the, the livelihood approach. And this is this is no simple matter. So it involves, again, a long term um, input and in, in, in management, but a very important part of the conservation recipe. So looking at diversification of agricultural approaches, kind of embedding those um, interventions, as I said earlier as well, but also looking at maybe other alternatives to maybe some more disruptive uh, previous traditional approaches. So here we have um, hydroponics approaches and sugar palm cultivation, permaculture in many different villages. And we're hoping to upscale those in the years coming. But really critical, it's just building on these social cultural behavioral understandings, working closely to co-create these solutions to tolerance and coexistence and building pride in the unique wildlife together and certainly not against the communities is, is absolutely critical and that definitely gives me hope for the protection of these wonderful primates and, and these are within their beautiful forest homes which i've been very grateful to have spent um, a long period of my life so if you have any questions at all um, i've gone over time a little bit maybe but please come to the workshop session later and we can unpack these all these notions um, but thank you very much for listening and look forward to the rest of this exciting event so thank you very much